Chapter 18 News from the Outside One spring day, a hoarse whistle sounded down the river. The little steamer, everybody cried. The little steamer is back again. Father hitched up the wagon, and the children all clambered in behind. Mother came out with her hands full of letters from Boston. On top was one addressed to Miss Annabelle Gray. If the sugar and coffee have come in, Johnny, be sure to lay in a supply. Yes, Harriet. And don't forget the mail. Oh, no, we won't forget the mail, shouted everybody. Only a few letters and papers got through by sledge during the winter, and the first steamer in the spring was sure to be loaded with news from the outside world. The little steamer was a keel boat belonging to the lumber company, and it was principally used to take men and goods up and down the river to different lumber camps. For the settlers, it meant something far more than this. It was the one thing that linked them up with the outside world. The riverbank was crowded with people to see the little steamer come in. Father drove up just as it reached the dock, and the children stood up in the back of the wagon and waved and cheered. "'What's the news, Skipper?' shouted someone on the bank. The captain tossed a coil of rope to the many eager hands on shore waiting to pull it in. "'General Lee has surrendered,' he shouted back. "'Lee surrendered? No! Can it be possible? Lee surrendered? Then, by golly, the war is ended! The abolitionists have won the war! Hooray! Hooray!' The people on the banks began tossing up their hats and shouting. The Woodlawn children shouted, too, hooray, 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 until their throats were hoarse. Eddie plucked Caddy by the skirt. Why is the war over, Caddy? Well, you see, said Caddy, giving Hetty an excited hug, General Lee is the leader of the South, and when he surrenders, that means that our side and President Lincoln's side has won the war. Hooray, shouted Hetty, hooray. Hooray for the slaves. Hooray for Abraham Lincoln, shouted Tom. The name of the president caught the crowd's fancy. Hooray for honest day, they cried. Long live Abe Lincoln. After the excitement of this news, even the piles of letters and papers from Boston for Mother were an anticlimax. But still there was the fun of breaking the news at home to Mother and Clara and Mrs. Conroy and the men. Father almost forgot the sugar and coffee and excitement of politics, and Hetty had to remind him. But at last they were on their way homeward, chattering and bouncing and shouting to make their voices heard above the rattling of the wheels. What a day it was! There were so many letters to be read, so many of the world's doings to be caught up with. That night, as they sat about the fire, even nuts and candle lighters were forgotten. They sat with wide eyes and clasped hands while Mother read aloud from the back numbers of the young lady's friend and the mother's assistant, and Clara turned the pages of Godey's lady's book and sighed over the beautiful costumes. At bedtime, they knelt together as they did when the circuit rider came, and Father gave thanks for the end of the war and begged that Mr. Lincoln be made strong and wise to lead them back to peace and security. Spring came quickly in the next few days, and what a happy spring it was, with no shadow of war to spoil its glitter. All through the woods sprang up a carpet of trilliums and windflowers and hepaticas. They were delicate pink and white and blue, and there were so many of them that picking did not spoil them. The wild cherry trees put on dresses of white like brides or young ladies at the first ball. The tender new leaves on the trees were almost as many colored as in autumn. Some were softly yellow, some pinkish red, some like bronze or copper. Later they would all be green, and they would grow dusty with summer and look tired and languid in the heat. But now everything was fresh and young. A magic time of year, Caddy called it to herself. She loved both spring and fall. At the turning of the year, things seemed to stir in her that were lost sight of in the commonplace stretches of winter and summer. One April afternoon, she went by herself to gather flowers in the woods. The morning doves had come back, and they were making a little sad refrain through the singing of the pines. The buckets hung empty on the sugar maple trees, for the syrup season was ended. There were some new pine slashings that filled the air with perfume. Like birch smoke and the smell of clover, the pine smell was a Wisconsin smell, and because she loved them so, they were part of Caddy Woodlawn. There was a flash of red in the branches above her head, and Caddy caught her breath in sharply. The cardinals were back. Almost every year a pair of them nested in the woods, and Father always expressed his surprise at seeing them so far north. They've come from the south, said Caddy to herself. Maybe they saw Nero. With her hands full of flowers, she skirted around the farm through the woods until she came to the hill north of the house. There she could look down and see house and barnyard spread out beneath her, and Robert Ireton spading the garden and never guessing that someone watched him from the hill. Here in the edge of the woods on the north hill was little Mary's grave. Father had made a little white picket fence around it to show that this was no longer woods but belonged to little Mary. 
It was hard to remember little Mary now. She had come with them from Boston, but she had died so soon and gone to rest on the North Hill. No one missed her now, and it was hard to imagine that she would have been near Hetty's age if she had lived. But sometimes it was nice to come here and sit beside her, because it was so peaceful on this hill, and one could see so far and think far thoughts. Caddy braided the stems of her flowers together into a garland and hung it across the little white fence for Mary. Then she leaned back on last year's autumn leaves and this year's flowers, and fell into a sort of happy daydream. Presently, she heard someone coming up the hill, and she sat up to see who it was. Hetty's energetic small legs were bringing her up the hill, her little red pigtails bobbing and shining. Oh, bother, said Caddy. She's got something to tell. But today Hetty had nothing to tell. She came up quietly and sat down beside Caddy, her round face flushed with the climb. I saw you up here, and I thought I'd come too, she said. It's nice up here, said Caddy. Yes, it is nice, said Hetty. After a while, she added, It's kind of nice just to be us two alone, too, isn't it? Without the boys. But I guess it's more fun for you with the boys. Oh, I don't know, said Caddy. Sometimes I get kind of tired of being with the boys all the time. I, can't, I came off by myself today. Maybe you'd rather I hadn't come, said Hetty. There was something unexpectedly wistful in her bright eyes. Why no, said Caddy. I think it's nicer since you came, Hetty. I really do. A pleased smile brightened Hetty's face. They sat, uh, sat on in silence for a while, but Caddy's mood of vacant daydreaming had passed. Something in Hetty's face had started a whole train of unaccustomed thoughts. She stole occasional glances at the serious round face, turned now across the farm toward the road which wound away in the distance. It was almost as if Caddy had never seen that little face before. Suddenly she understood for the first time that Hetty was all by herself. Minnie was too young, and Tom, Caddy, and Ward had no room in their adventures for a tagging and tattling little sister. Was her eagerness to be the first to tell only her way of trying to make herself important in the eyes of all the selfish older people? If little Mary had lived... Caddy, look, cried Hetty, suddenly jumping to her feet and pointing. It's a circuit rider. He's coming along the road. Caddy's thoughts scattered like frightened birds. She, too, sprang to her feet and focused her eyes on the distant road. Sure enough, she cried, it's Mr. Tanner. How long he was gone this time. Let's run down and meet him. I want to tell him that I was the one who mended his clock. Come on. Away they ran, down the hill, across the newly plowed field, through the barnyard, and into the barn to tell Father. Father, the circuit rider's coming. Father, Mr. Tanner's on the road. He'll be here in a minute. Bless my soul, I'll be glad to see him, said Father. It's been a long time, and he's been so far back in the woods. I wonder if he's heard of Lee's surrender. Mr. Tanner rode slowly up the lane to the barn. His horse looked tired and muddy, but there was something so strange and sad about Mr. Tanner himself that the children stopped halfway in running to meet him. It was as if he carried bad news for them. Hey, Mr. Tanner, cried Father, welcome home again. But you look as if you had not heard the good news. Is it possible that no one has told you the war has ended? Mr. Tanner got down slowly and stood a moment with his hand on his horse's neck, his head bowed. When he spoke, his voice was deep and husky. God help us, Mr. Woodlawn, he said at last. I have later news than yours. Abraham Lincoln has been shot.